Hello and welcome to this ABDO CPD recorded CET lecture, Coronavirus Infection Control and Prevention in Optical Practice. My name is Peter Black and you may know me as a past president of ABDO and uh, this lecture is an update on the uh, Dispensing Optics article um, infection control in optical practice uh, for which I was awarded the ABDO Dispensing Optics Readership Prize for the best CET article uh, in 2019. You can still find that article on uh, the ABDO website. The learning objectives for this lecture um, for a dispensing optician are 1.1.2 to develop an understanding of patient questioning to elicit information in relation to coronavirus symptoms uh, and the situation. Uh, 2.5.3 to examine the latest evidence available in relation um, to COVID-19 uh, and optical practice and to consider how this may impact your clinical practice and if you haven't yet done so your return to work. Um, and 2.12.1 to ensure that a safe environment is provided to deliver care to your patients in relation to coronavirus and take appropriate action if this is not the case. The learning outcomes for contact lens opticians are essentially the same. However, contact lens opticians do need to bear in mind that their practice carries uh, somewhat more risk than that of a dispensing optician and in particular need to think about the disinfection of reusable trial lenses and use of the slit lamp in the context of these learning objectives. Similarly, uh, the learning outcomes for optometrists are the same. However, again, optometrists need to think about the different scope of practice and those activities that may present a risk, such as non-contact tonometry, and applanation tonometry. Uh, the lecture itself is in two halves. Um, after the introduction, uh, the first half of the lecture will be to refresh your memory about normal infection control procedures, and then it will move on to the specifics in relation to coronavirus, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 stroke COVID-19 pandemic that we are currently living with. We'll cover patient triage, hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, cleaning and disinfection routines, including those for ophthalmic frames and other items such as sunglasses, as well as some operational issues that may make it easier for you to return to work and maintain the safety of practice staff and patients alike. An understanding of infection prevention and control is nothing new in eye care practice. It's something that we've always had to be mindful of. And in 2016, when the General Optical Council introduced the new standards of practice for optometrists and dispensing opticians, the safety of our patients and specifically infection control procedures were enshrined within those standards. On this slide are some of the words taken from standard 12, which is to ensure a safe environment for your patients. We're asked to ensure a safe environment to comply with health and safety legislation, ensure that the equipment that we use is hygienic, and also uh, dispose of any um, clinical or hazardous materials in the appropriate way. 12.1.6 specifically says, that we must minimise the risk of infection by following appropriate infection controls, including hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is the single most important thing in terms of infection control um, that any healthcare practitioner or indeed member of the public can do during this pandemic or any other outbreak of any other infection. It's all wor also worth thinking about at this stage, um, standard of practice 11, which is to protect and safeguard patients, colleagues and others from harm. The current pandemic has highlighted 
the definition of what might constitute a vulnerable patient. And uh, in terms of the uh, current pandemic and the risk of infection um, from COVID-19, the vulnerable patients include many of the typical patients within an optical practice. Patients over 70 would be considered vulnerable to this disease, as are patients with diabetes. And it's important that we can question patients and ascertain whether they're vulnerable at the outset before they attend for an appointment. And we'll talk about this a little later on. So first we need to refresh our memory of what infection is and how under normal circumstances we can prevent it. I've often presented discussion workshops on infection control and usually ask the question, what is infection? And quite often we get a response that infection is inflammation. But that is only partially true. Inflammation, the localised swelling, redness and the heat generated uh, that's associated with inflammation is not only unique to infection. Inflammation can occur in re response to allergy and also in response to trauma. So infection is something slightly different. We also need to ask what causes infections. Milledo in the Dictionary of Optometry defines infection as an invasion of the body by dis disease causing microorganisms, for example, bacteria, virus, fungus or a parasite. Um, and he goes on to say that treatment typically includes anti-infective drugs such as antibiotics, antivirals or antifungal agents. One of the worrying aspects about the current coronavirus pandemic is that it is a new disease to science and as such there is no uh, effective treatment other than looking after the body, providing breathing support until the uh, body's own immune system uh, enables the patient to get better. Hopefully uh, in due course vaccination will also be an option. The diagram on the slide shows the chain of infection and uh, it's important to note uh, that obviously an infection requires some form of microorganism capable of invading the body. Those microorganisms are uh, held, if you like, in reservoirs um, from which um, the, uh, the microorganism can be released at some point in order to infect a susceptible host. If you've been watching some of the films that have become rather fashionable over the last few months during the current pandemic, um, they have potentially accurately predicted that the reservoir for coronavirus may well be bats. And in one of the films, the bats were uh, roosting above a pigsty, their the droppings entered the pig's food, and from there, uh, the uh, pig, uh, after it was processed for meat, um, became the source of the infection that went around the world. And it's not unlikely that a similar um, mode of transmission um, has happened here. So the chain of infection involves a reservoir, which could be animals, people, uh, a water supply or food. Um, the the infectious organisms need to be able to re, um, be released from uh, that reservoir, for example, in blood uh, or secretions or excretions from the body or simply uh, in, on the skin. Um, we'll think about the modes of transmission, whether that is airborne, for example, or due to direct physical contact. How then do infective organisms enter the body in order to cause disease um, and what makes the uh, 
patient susceptible to that disease in the first place. So infection is an invasion of the body by a microorganism and there are various different types. Probably most common are bacteria. Uh, there are a variety of different bacteria. Uh, on a previous slide, you saw the small round uh, organisms. In, in that case, Staphylococcus aureus, a common cause of hospital acquired infection. Bacteria are classified according to those the shapes. So uh, the coccus are the small round ones. Um, you can see here a bacillus or a rod shaped uh, bacterium. And they're also classified according to how they take up uh, a variety of stains. The most notable one of them being the gram stain. Um, bacteria that are called gram positive show up as purple under that stain and this particular one, you can see the top left diagram or photograph, uh, is a gram negative bacteria, which is shown up as pink. The second form of microorganisms are viruses, and the coronavirus is one uh, of the many, many viruses that can infect uh, the human body. And coronaviruses themselves cause the common cold and a number of other respiratory infections. Fungi are also a potent source of infection, although fungal infections tend to be very rare. Normally, uh, they can be uh, quite serious, especially if they affect the eye. We can see on the bottom centre and right hand side uh, examples of two different fungi. Uh, Aspergillus niger is a familiar black mould. Um, which if, if, if it infects the body can uh, have desert, devastating consequences. And Fusarium is um, a problematic fungus uh, with relation to eye care. It's been responsible for a number of outbreaks of fungal keratitis and has caused the closure of a number of contact lens solution plants over the years. Other causes of infection include protozoans, um, protozoa are single-celled animals. As such, they're much larger than bacteria, although still generally microscopic. And certainly in Ica, uh, the most notable one is a camphamoeba. A camphamoeba not only has devastating consequences, including potentially uh, blindness and death, uh, it's also a very uh, interesting microorganism. Uh, in that it, as well as having a free living trophocyte form, which you can see in the top right photograph here, it can also form highly resistant cysts, uh, which um, it does under adverse conditions such as desiccation or dryness and uh, or a lack of food supply, and can survive uh, most disinfection methods and some sterilization methods in that form. The body can also be infected by parasites. Um, a number of uh, worms, for example, um, a notable one uh, in relation to eyes is the helminth worm that causes river blindness, which is the second uh, biggest cause of uh, infection related blindness in the world. Uh, prions are not really microorganisms, they're modified protein molecules that cause diseases such as variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease and bovine spongiform encephalopathy or BSE, uh, which was a, a former uh, epidemic um, that this country has dealt with in the past, um, also known as mad cow disease, which can be spread uh, to humans. And finally, algae are not usually a problem um, of infection in, in human beings. However, there are a, a few um, of these single celled uh, plants uh, that can cause serious infection. And uh, certainly if they're related to shellfish, 
uh, can cause a very serious toxic reaction. So what kinds of infection do we seek to prevent in clinical practice? And the short answer is all of them. Um, although we're generally not seeing patients who are ill, we do sometimes have patients presenting with eye conditions, or eye infections, some of which are highly contagious, thinking about viral conjunctivitis, for example. And we need to have procedures uh, in place so that we uh, do not spread uh, eye infections from one patient to another. We also need to consider the general infections that many people uh, suffer, such as the common cold and influenza uh, and other infections that people may carry. We need to take action to ensure that those infections are not transmitted from patient to practitioner or from patient uh, to another patient uh, via, for example, the handling of different products or uh, touching of different aspects uh, of the practice environment. So the kind of uh, infections that we seek to prevent in clinical practice include eye infections. And uh, this picture on the right hand side is uh, acanthamoeba keratitis with its characteristic ring infiltrate. And uh, the prevention of eye infections is not simply about our procedures in practice, it's also about the instructions that we give our patients, particularly contact lens patients, uh, in terms of how they look after their lenses uh, and look after their eyes. Skin infections are also something we need to be concerned about. If a patient has a skin infection and is um, trying on frames, for example, uh, that could be transmitted to another patient. Uh, Bloodborne diseases are not normally uh, a problem. However, uh, in my experience, the most common injury in optical practice is a, um, a, a needle stick injury caused by optical screwdrivers. And if those screwdrivers have been used for, you know, uh, cleaning out the, the gunk, if you like, from frames, and then subsequently you injure yourself, uh, there's a fair chance you could introduce microorganisms uh, into that wound, and that could be a problem. Normally, of course, the body would fight off these kind of injuries very easily, but if you yourself are immune compromised, if you're diabetic, for example, uh, then that's something you should take quite seriously. Uh, there should be procedures in place to ensure these kind of injuries don't happen. Uh, good lighting in the repair area, for example, is very helpful, as is a well-designed repair station with a solid base uh, to lean on so that it's much less likely uh, that you slip and injure yourself. Gastrointestinal infections are things that from time to time uh, affect communities um, and you know standard infection control procedures good standards of cleanliness and hygiene are essential in ensuring that these are not spread they do tend to be highly contagious when they happen particularly in an environment where there's a lot of children and finally and of most concern at the moment is respiratory infections including the common cold, influenza, and of course, uh, the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. In order to prevent the transmission of infection, we first need to understand how infection is transmitted. In human beings, the Transmission of disease causing microorganisms happens in four different ways, um, and some of those ways can be subdivided uh, into other categories. At the first is airborne transmission, and um, there are two uh, methods here. One is so called aerosol transmission, where the particles are so fine they're held in the atmosphere and are breathed in naturally. This is thought to be a key way of transmitting influenza, for example. And the second one is direct airborne transmission, such as when somebody 
coughs or sneezes uh, directly into your face because they haven't covered their hands or are not uh, covered their mouth with their hands or are not wearing a face mask, for example. Um, in terms of the current pandemic, uh, the aerosol transmission is not thought to be an issue. Um, it is more to do with airborne transmission um, from coughs, sneezes, um, forced breathing, such as when uh, exercising, for example, and then those droplets land on surfaces from which they can be picked up by uh, direct contact. So uh, infection is often caused by contact with another person um, and including with faeces if we're talking about uh, gastrointestinal uh, disease. And um, also this is uh, includes fomite transmission, which is when a surface or for example the hands become um, contaminated with a microorganism that is then uh, transmitted um, to a point of infection such as the mouth or the eyes. A third case is contamination by water and uh, in developing nations this is um, a continual problem with diseases such as cholera, um, endemic where water uh, supplies are not treated with chlorine. And the final one is infection of the bloodstream and tissues um, due to um, direct uh, contact uh, with the blood through a wound, for example, perhaps an insect bite um, or some form of injury. Under normal circumstances in optical practice, there's a variety of things we need to take into account to prevent the transmission of infection. To prevent transmission through direct contact, then hand washing is vitally important. And we should also be regularly sanitizing all hard surfaces, including those that the patient comes into contact, such as chin rests, uh, etc. Whilst we almost always, I suspect, are very mindful to disinfect things like chin rests, for opters, trial frames and so on, there are many things that our patients touch that we're less uh, thorough with, such as the arms on the waiting room chairs or spectacle frames or the pupillometer. Um, we should be ensuring that we're disinfecting these items uh, regularly and uh, in this heightened situation that we find ourselves um, these kind of items should be disinfected every time. It's really important from a direct contact point of view that reusable appliances are disinfected or sterilized as appropriate uh, between patients. The second type of transmission related to direct contact, um, which has become um, a mainstream word in the last few months is fomite transmission. And this refers to the secondary transmission of a disease from the inanimate objects that I mentioned before. So for example, if a patient uh, or a passenger, for example, on, on public transport was to sneeze. And uh, even if, say, they sneezed into their hand, but then touched the grab rail with their hand, then the next person to touch that grab rail will pick up uh, that infection and could transmit it to a mucous membrane uh, in the mouth or the eyes uh, and become infected themselves. The next uh, transmission type is airborne, which we've already mentioned. Um, one of the things I've always asked in the past is that, uh, should we wear a face mask if we have a cold? We have a culture in the UK generally of dragging ourselves into work if we have a cold, but that's not particularly good for the people we expose to that uh, infection. And if those patients are themselves immune compromised, perhaps they're living with cancer or have HIV AIDS or are diabetic, um, 
if that cold is a serious one, that could produce, uh, be, could end up as particularly difficult for them in terms of a very serious, potentially life-threatening infection. So um, my advice would be, if you must drag yourself into work with a cold, uh, you should wear a mask when dealing with patients, especially if in a close proximity, such as conducting eye examinations. Airborne infection is also reduced if there is a continuous circulation of air in the practice. So it's important to have good ventilation and that or the air conditioning system is regularly surfaced. Um, air conditioning is itself a potent source of infection uh, if it isn't maintained well. A number of infections are also waterborne and it's important that the sink areas uh, within our practice are spotlessly clean. Um, it's not acceptable to have those grey, dirty, slimy areas around the base of taps that we see in motorway service stations uh, from time to time. If you have uh, that kind of um, dirt, it's almost certainly completely uh, saturated with microorganisms, including acanthamoeba, which is found in tap water and will thrive in those kind of environments. Another aspect found in most practices these days are water coolers, either in the staff area and often for patients. And these need to be regularly uh, serviced and uh, sanitized uh, to avoid them themselves becoming a source of infection. Um, food contamination isn't usually a problem within the optical environment, uh, but if you ever do events where you serve food uh, to customers, um, or perhaps you serve coffee on a regular basis, then again, um, food hygiene standards need to be maintained. Another aspect where um, food-related uh, illness can occur is if the staff fridge is not properly maintained. And certainly in places where I've worked in the past, any items that were still in the fridge um, at the end of the week uh, were disposed of. Um, to ensure that the fridge itself did not become a source of infection. And finally, uh, inoculation or the directory to the bloodstream of an infection via a wound. We've already mentioned screwdriver injuries, and it's important to ensure that there is an up-to-date first aid kit that uh, if somebody does have one of those kind of injuries that they're able to uh, clean the wound, apply antiseptic and apply a plaster uh, to avoid it becoming infected. We've already talked about the chain of infection. This is just a blown up version, which might be a little easier to read. So when we talk about infection prevention and control, we often use a number of decontamination terms such as clean, disinfect, sanitize, and in relation to uh, food perhaps pasteurize, and also sterilize. But what do these terms actually mean? The, the following are the uh, commonly used decontamination terms that you're likely to come across. So clean literally means to physically remove the dirt. And um, if appropriate, drying is an important part of cleaning. For example, when we clean our hands before handling contact lenses, we should dry them too. Um, cleaning dramatically reduces the number of microorganisms present on the hands, for example, or on a given surface, and re um, effectively pre prevents the multiplication by removing their food source. Cleaning will uh, remove probably over 90% of microorganisms. Um, disinfection is, is a level above, so normally one would conduct cleaning before uh, disinfecting. So, and disinfecting will kill the majority of microorganisms but not the resistant spores 
uh, we talked about earlier. Sanitize is, to be honest, more of a marketing term than, than a specific um, infection control term. And I take it to mean clean and disinfect. Although when we use hand sanitizer, um, really we're disinfecting hands that may or may, or may not be clean. Um, pasteurization, um, which is the process used to um, maintain the shelf life of fresh milk, for example, uh, is sim simply means to disinfect by heating to between 65 and 80 degrees centigrade. Uh, when you wash clothes on a hot wash, um, or for example, wash your dishes in the dishwasher at 70 degrees centigrade, you're effectively pasteurizing those items and you're removing the most common dangerous um, organisms that are likely to cause particularly uh, gastrointestinal problems. Um, and finally, uh, we have sterilize. So sterilization essentially means eliminating microorganisms, um, either by killing them or by completely removing them. Um, this can be achieved by a number of means. For example, contact lens solutions are often uh, sterilized by filtration. Um, many kinds of um, non-disposable contact lenses are sterilized in an autoclave, with the, which is essentially a pressure cooker which uh, applies pressure so that the heat um, uh, can be increased and it uses steam uh, usually around 120 degrees centigrade um, for something like 20 to 30 minutes in order to kill microorganisms. Um, there are also uh, chemical means such as sodium hypochlorite and irradiation is also a common means of sterilizing items such as with exposure to ultraviolet light. The image to the right hand side here uh, shows the difference between uh, clean hands and disinfected or sanitized hands. So we can see the top image uh, where uh, in this case a small child's hand has been um, placed on the agar plate and then the microorganisms uh, cultured so that they become visible. Um, the second plate shows uh, the same hand after it's been washed and um, the third plate which has barely any colonies of bacteria present uh, shows the same hand after it's been sanitized using a proprietary uh, sanitizer um, who have supplied this image. In terms of infection prevention and control, nothing is more important than rigorous hand hygiene. Hand washing is the single most important action any eye care professional can take to prevent and control infection in optical practice. As practitioners, we should wash our hands when we arrive at work and also on arriving home, always after going to the toilet or for example, changing a baby's nappy. We should always wash our hands before eating or preparing food and in our personal lives, uh, immediately after handling raw meat, for example, in the kitchen. We should wash our hands after sneezing or coughing, after touching animals, and whenever we know our hands have been uh, contaminated or look dirty. We should also, of course, at work, wash our hands before every patient, and we should do so in front of them so that they know we've done it. And in addition to that, we should uh, wash our hands again before handling contact lenses or instilling eye drops. Patients should also be instructed to wash their hands whenever you require them to handle their own contact lenses. For example, when we're doing a teach, 
uh, for a new patient or if you're checking the, the patient's technique on insertion and removal. At present, we will also be requiring our patients to uh, conduct hand hygiene, whether that's hand washing or the use of hand sanitizer, immediately on arrival at the practice. As regards hand washing, then the NHS offers uh, a five step simple process, wet, soap, wash, rinse and dry. So um, they recommend uh, that we should wash our forearms as well as our hands and that we require to remove uh, any watches or wrist or hand jewellery before doing so. We should uh, wet our hands and forearms with warm water, uh, use soap and create a lather and then wash uh, including rubbing our wrists, palms, backs of hands, each finger and thumbs and including nails for at least 20 seconds. We should then rinse thoroughly with warm water and dry thoroughly, ideally using disposable towels. The disposable towel can then be used to also turn off the tap. Sharing towels obviously presents an infection risk through direct transmission, but also um, hand dryers, which have previously been thought to be hygienic, are not recommended because they can aerosolize uh, the microorganisms and the current advice is that they're not appropriate uh, during the current pandemic. Hand sanitizing gels can be used in addition uh, or when washing is not possible and should have a minimum alcohol content of 70%. It has now been shown uh, that chemical uh, based hand sanitizers are also effective against coronavirus. Now we'll look at the specifics of the uh, coronavirus COVID-19 situation and what we know uh, about the virus and the current government advice um, in terms of infection control procedures. We'll look at um, what kind of virus it is and how it can be effectively uh, killed, how it spreads, what the incubation period is um, and the duration uh, when people may show no symptoms. We'll look at what those symptoms might be when people develop the disease and uh, what the government advice is currently on what to do um, if you've contacted somebody who subsequently developed the disease. It should be said that at the time um, of recording this uh, on the 16th of June 2020 that uh, the advice is shifting day by day um, and you are advised to keep up to date with the advice of the professional bodies including ABDO. Um, it's also worth checking uh, the .gov website for the latest advice too. And at the end of this presentation, there's a number of references uh, which you should find very helpful. So what is uh, coronavirus and how can it be effectively killed? It's probably worth saying at this point that scientists actually disagree as to whether or not viruses are in fact alive. They tend to be uh, inert and uh, are not capable of reproduction uh, unless they invade a host cell and take over its genetic um, code and its ability to replicate. Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses which include uh, the many different strains of the common cold. Um, some of them uh, cause less severe disease than others. Um, 
and the more severe diseases caused by coronaviruses include the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS and Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome or SARS uh, which was um, part of a um, an epidemic about a decade ago. So SARS-CoV-2 uh, is the second such epidemic and this particular virus is new to science as of the back end of uh, 2019 and it has no specific cure um, and currently a vaccine is not available either. Um, so treatment uh, includes um, res respirator support uh, to help the patient breathe um, but really at the moment it's essentially a case of um, keeping the patient alive long enough that their immune system can combat uh, the disease themselves. That said for the majority of people who contract SARS-CoV-2 it's not a serious disease as such and the uh, UK has recently reclassified it um, so that it is no longer a disease of high consequence um, and that's because the fatality rates are relatively low uh, compared with other high consequence infectious diseases. However uh, as of the middle of June 2020 there had been uh, some 7.88 million diagnosed cases and of which 433,000 patients had died. What isn't clear at the moment is whether or not many of those patients may have died anyway due to other underlying causes. It's a sad fact that pneumonia in particular and this is a kind of pneumonia um, does take the lives of many hundreds of thousands if not millions of people worldwide um, usually because their immune systems are weakened uh, towards the end of their life but through other reasons. The symptoms for um, SARS-CoV-2 include fever, uh, cough especially a new and persistent cough, chest tightness, anosmia or a loss of the sense of smell, myalgia which is a generalized uh, muscle pain so the body will ache all over uh, not dissimilar uh, perhaps to a severe case of flu, um, fatigue or tiredness and dyspnea uh, which um, is a shortness of breath so the feeling that you simply can't get enough breath um, in order to, to survive, which obviously like an asthma attack can be very, very uh, worrying for the patient, distressing for the patient. Uh, the good news in terms of um, disabling this virus is that almost any method of cleaning or disinfection will kill SARS-CoV-2. It's now clear that coronavirus is mainly transmitted through either direct or fomite contact uh, with the virus particles or with direct inhalation of airborne droplets um, from somebody who is in close proximity to you. Um, social distancing remains really important because those airborne droplets um, are heavier than air and will fall to the floor um, providing you maintain a distance of uh, two meters. Um, the initial research however has identified that the virus is present in all bodily fluids um, and excretions with the exception of sweat and this also includes tears and feces. Um, SARS coronavirus 2 can survive for around two days on your clothes and longer perhaps 72 hours uh, on some hard surfaces. Um, 
it isn't resistant to standard um, soaps and detergents and um, so normal procedures for hand washing and for the washing of clothes and kitchen utensils etc um, are recommended however the UK government does recommend that for uh, items that are very heavily soiled such as sports kit or shared towels uh, then a hot wash um, should be used because those items are much more likely to contain a greater load of bodily fluids and potentially a greater load of virus particles. Um, I have to say in my personal experience that most sports kit um, is only suited to a cool wash of 30 or 40 degrees centigrade and is likely to be ruined by a hot wash. Um, I would recommend therefore uh, that you follow the manufacturer's instructions and if you are concerned that the sports kit uh, is still contaminated then the sensible thing to do is to not wear that kit for three or four days by which time any virus particles um, would have become deactivated and then it's safe to wear the clothes again. The incubation period for COVID-19 uh, is between one day and two weeks with a median average incubation period of five days. Um, when booking patients in for appointments, whether that's emergency, um, essential, non-routine or uh, indeed routine uh, eye examinations, we need to triage the patients with regards to both the eye examination symptoms so that we may prioritize those over routine uh, appointments and also we need to triage them with regard to any potential symptoms within the last two weeks of the coronavirus. So uh, for the present time, uh, we need to be triaging patients and prioritizing the, those that have symptoms relating to their visual needs. And of course, that do not have symptoms relating to coronavirus. We need to check that the appointment is a necessary one. And we need to quiz the patient as to their visual symptoms and also to the hopeful lack of coronavirus symptoms. The guidance since the 15th of June 2020 has been that symptomatic non-emergency patients should now be able to book appointments for eye examinations. Um, however, in England currently, the uh, state of play is that we can only see private patients in this way. Uh, please check uh, the advice of the professional bodies uh, for when this changes. It's recommended then uh, that an approved triage form is used um, and that this is retained with the patient's record. Uh, so you can see uh, to the right of the slide, um, the ABDO triage form and others are available from other professional bodies uh, or your NHS body. We need to check whether or not the patient has had any symptoms of coronavirus uh, in the past two weeks and ask them questions such as do they have a fever or a cough or any loss, uh, new loss of taste or smell. Um, also, for example, do they have muscle pain, etc. It's worth going through the whole list with every patient to be sure. It's quite likely that practices that are on reduced capacity of eye examinations initially will actually get quite booked up as there is almost certainly some pent up demand in the system from patients who have uh, damaged their glasses, scratched them or simply have a prescription that is now out of date. Um, if you are seeing patients that have maybe booked a week or two ahead, then it's advisable to uh, confirm the appointment the day before 
and to uh, refresh the patient's memory um, that they shouldn't attend if they've had any of these symptoms. And also inform them of your infection control procedures uh, within practice. At the moment, it's not clear whether patients are to be required to wear face masks, although it would appear uh, to be a sensible precaution, but they will be required to uh, observe hand hygiene procedures. There are some kinds, some patients who, for religious reasons, reasons will not use alcohol gels, and you should have an alternative uh, product available, such as a benzalkonium chloride hand sanitizer, or offer the patients to be able to wash their hands using ordinary uh, soap and water. Whatever your procedures. Patients need to be made aware of them in advance. So hand hygiene remains the single most important infection control procedure. And in a sense, your hand hygiene procedures should not be any different to normal. You just need to be much more thorough and much more fastidious in the application of them. We all sometimes forget to wash our hands when we should do. How many times have you been into a fast food outlet and eaten your food using your fingers without thinking twice that you haven't washed your hands? This is not good practice, especially if you've just spent time handling a touchscreen ordering device and um, a credit card machine in the process. So we need to ensure we maintain fastidious hand hygiene and we also need to require patients to do the same when entering our premises and any time uh, they uh, are embarking upon a new procedure such as handling frames. Normal hand hygiene must be maintained for contact lens practice and optometric examinations. So we should wash our hands when we arrive at work and at the start of each clinic, uh, when putting on or taking off personal protective equipment, before every patient, whenever we feel our hand, hands may have been contaminated from touching any item, such as a tap, a door handle, um, a piece of ophthalmic equipment and so on. And also we should wash our hands uh, at the normal routine times such as before and after food, after using the toilet. And we should also remember uh, to uh, help avoid taking infection home with us to ensure that we wash our hands every time when we arrive home from work or from shopping, etc. There has been much debate about personal protective equipment and it would appear a lot of dithering by government agencies uh, as to who should wear protective equipment and for what tasks. My personal opinion is that in reality uh, there was insufficient supply to meet the demand and the situation has been managed um, in order to ensure that those who needed it most could get it. Now that there do appear to be um, sufficient quantities of personal protective equipment available and um, it would make sense to minimize risk of infection <coughs> that as many people wear it for as many tasks as possible. The greatest risk is through direct contamination of a mucous membrane that is the mouth and the respiratory system or the eyes from droplets via a direct cough or sneeze or subsequent contamination um, from a contaminated surface. In normal practice, therefore, we need to make sure that we guard against uh, ourselves coughing in the direction of a patient and contaminating them and vice versa. It's really important, therefore, that we wear face masks and that uh, appropriate instruments are fitted with cough guards and we also wear visors or safety glasses. 
particularly when we're in close proximity to patients for clinical reasons, such as conducting eye examinations, contact lens appointments, or when taking dispensing measurements. Face masks can be used for a whole session, such as a morning or afternoon clinic, but should be disposed of if they become contaminated or become wet through. There will be uh, areas of the practice where a perspex screen may be more appropriate, such as at reception. And we also need to think about the clothing we wear, consider wearing overalls and uh, perhaps also aprons. Clothing should be washed after each day at work and it may be that lab coats are more appropriate than a suit or a uniform. Um, ties are well known and proven to be a potent source of infection and are best avoided under all circumstances. We should also avoid long sleeves. Wearing short sleeves enables us to wash our hands properly, including our wrists and forearms. The use of so much personal protective equipment also provides us with a new problem of how to dispose of the waste. Practices already have um, a system in place uh, for waste disposal and this could continue to be followed. The government has advised that there are not sufficient facilities to process uh, the uh, unprecedented amount of personal protective equipment as clinical waste and therefore from non-hazardous situations such as optical practice um, it is now recommended that personal protective equipment is double bagged and stored for three days and then disposed of via the general waste. Uh, if in any doubt you're advised to contact your normal waste disposal provider for clarification. So um, how and how often should we clean our practices? Uh, the first thing to recognise is that if your practice has not been in operation um, for a few months, then coronavirus won't be a problem. That said, it's not good practice to have any form of dirt lying around and we should take the opportunity to deep clean our practices, pulling out furniture uh, and ensuring that all dusty nooks and crannies are cleaned thoroughly. Uh, there is a useful um, American website, the Center for Disease Control, which has some good advice uh, in addition um, to the UK advice, uh, which will follow in the next slide. We need to um, pay particular attention to high traffic areas and particularly those areas of the practice which people touch with their hands. This should include tables and desks, uh, doorknobs, night sw light switches, um, countertops, uh, any handles or uh, grab rails, um, electronic equipment that's handled frequently such as phones, keyboards and mice, uh, toilets and particularly uh, taps and areas around sinks and uh, also items such as touch screens on ophthalmic equipment and also the controls that the patient uses um, as well as the controls that are used by staff when carrying out pre-screening activity. You can view the government advice on the gov.uk website. However, I've taken the view that in general, uh, in an optical practice, we will be seeing patients who are not showing symptoms of coronavirus and unlike a healthcare setting, um, where it's highly likely they will see patients with COVID-19, it's fairly unlikely that we will. And therefore, um, I've uh, included the decontamination procedures that are advised for non-healthcare settings. You need to take advice if you know for a fact that you have had uh, patients uh, in that, are, uh, that have COVID-19. Um, 
the, the truth is that normal household disinfectant products uh, are effective against corona nine, uh, coronavirus COVID-19 and uh, the use of these will reduce the risk of passing on the infection uh, to other people. Uh, when cleaning you should use disposable gloves or washing up gloves and aprons and these should be uh, disposed of um, double bagged and stored securely for three days uh, and then thrown away in the regular rubbish. Uh, it's best to use uh, disposable cloths. First clean the hard surfaces with warm soapy water and then disinfect them uh, with cleaning products such as anti-back sprays that contain benzyl codeine chloride. Um, as I've said, you should pay particular attention to those frequently touched areas, um, such as door handles, alarm panels, telephones, and so on. One word of warning is when disinfecting equipment, such as um, frame rules, for example, some products will remove the print from those uh, products, and uh, it's important to check that the disinfection product is suitable for the device that you're cleaning. It's also advisable if you are um, cleaning an area that's heavily contaminated that you use personal protective equipment such as eye protection and um, a, a mask to cover the mouth and nose as well as wearing the gloves and an apron. After you finish cleaning, again, observe normal hand hygiene uh, yourself by washing your hands um, with soap and water for 20 seconds after removing your gloves and other personal protective equipment. Um, the government advice can be found at the link at the bottom of the slide. Uh, ABDO has received a lot of requests for guidance on the cleaning and disinfection of frames between patients. And you will find uh, on the link on this slide um, that ABDO has managed to compile um, some guidance on frame cleaning um, from seven manufacturers and also the French optical industry body, GIFO. Um, the advice from the manufacturers does vary considerably um, however they do all seem to be in agreement that um, an ultraviolet lamp is a safe way uh, to disinfect a frame without causing it any damage it may be that you already have a uv lamp that is used for photochromic uh, lens demonstration and depending on the wavelength at which that product operates, it may also be suitable for this. Uh, so the table in this slide um, is courtesy of Silhouette and you can um, see that they have put together a variety of means that might be considered safe to uh, clean and disinfect ophthalmic frames and sunglasses without damaging them. Um, their advice applies only to their own products. Um, however, you can see that bleach is not advised for any products under any circumstances. And that advice um, also applies to all other manufacturers. So bleach should not be used at all. Um, for Silhouette products, then um, an alcohol-based uh, cleaner is suitable. And a lot of standard spectacle lens cleaning sprays that we use in practice do contain alcohol and may be suitable uh, in their own right. In order for alcohol to be effective as a disinfectant, it needs to contain a minimum of 30% alcohol. But in order to avoid damaging a frame, then the concentration should be no more than 60%. Alcohol is not suitable um, for uh, spraying on polycarbonate lenses, although it is said that it can be applied to the cloth uh, and uh, used in that way. 
and exposure of all um, frame products to an alcohol-based disinfectant should be no more than 30 seconds. The third method of disinfection is to expose uh, frames to a temperature above 60 degrees centigrade. From memory, I think acetate uh, reaches its softening point at 57 degrees. So this is not suitable for this method of disinfection. However, um, in terms of frame materials, certainly all silhouette products um, are OK at this. Um, how you achieve that, however, is another matter altogether. Um, I don't know of any reliable way of uh, subjecting frames to a 60 degree uh, temperature. Uh, in practice. Many of the frames manufacturers listed on the ABDO website recommend 3% um, hydrogen peroxide diluted uh, half and half um, so that it becomes 1.5%. Uh, Silhouette here are recommending diluting it sixfold uh, to 0.5% concentrat concentration. Um, their information says that 3% by itself is unlikely to damage any of their frames, and but the minimum concentration in order to have a disinfectant effect is 0.5%. They recommend a 10 minute application. So you can see that this is not recommended for acetate, but is recommended for metal, titanium, injection molded SPX frames, uh, gold plated, and also um, for the high index lens materials. The next category of disinfection products is the 0.04% quaternary ammonium compounds. And I have to admit that I had to look these up myself. However, these are very common disinfection and preservative products and include amongst them benzalkonium chloride, uh, which is probably the most common uh, disinfectant used in uh, anti back sprays, for example, and also the preservative uh, methyl isothiazolinone, uh, which is commonly found in antibacterial soaps, uh, amongst other products. Um, really, the issue here is the concentration of these products. We can see that at 0.04%, Silhouette does not recommend these products at all. Uh, and one of the issues is that it's not possible with some products to determine uh, what the concentration of these chemical disinfectants are. Probably the most ideal um, disinfection procedure is to use a UV lamp, as previously stated. Um, the lamp should be between 230 and 280 nanometers and it's uh, the ideal is at 245 nanometers and the procedure should happen for five minutes uh, to be effective. Um, this, uh, according to Silhouette, is recommended for metal, titanium, SPX um, and gold plated frames. Um, however, other manufacturers do recommend it for acetate. And I see no reason why wooden frames could not be subject um, to this, although it could potentially cause fading if uh, repeated many times over. It's recommended that soapy water in an ultrasonic tank is also uh, a good method of cleaning and disinfecting frames. Uh, and most manufacturers recommend this. Um, the maximum concentration uh, of the detergent or soap uh, uh, is 5%. So it needs diluting um, so that the soap content is between 5% at the upper level and 3% at the lower level. And it should only happen for about three minutes. Um, you do need to take care using ultrasonic cleaners. Uh, take care not to put the spectacles face down or you'll scratch the lenses. And if the um, frames are left in there for too long, it could cause a whitening of many plastic 
brain materials, especially those that belong to the patient and have been worn for some time. Um, so it, you're advised to invest in an ultrasonic cleaner that has a timer and set it for those three minutes. If disinfecting patients' own frames where the, there is a heavy amount of soiling between the lenses and the frame, you're advised to dismantle the spectacles and clean the around the lenses and in the groove uh, of the rim uh, manually before using the ultrasonic cleaner. And the final method recommended by Silhouette uh, for their products is to use disinfectant wipes sold uh, in shops. And um, they claim that as sold, these disinfectants are suitable for all of their frames. Um, again, uh, looking at the disinfectant wipes that I have at home, these mainly contain these quaternary ammonium compounds that they uh, recommend against. Um, and it's difficult to know what the uh, concentration is, as it's not declared on a lot of the packaging. Um, so my advice in terms of frames is always take the advice of each individual manufacturer. Remember that some frame materials, uh, such as um, nylon based products, uh, such as TR90, uh, can be easily damaged by alcohol. Um, based cleaners uh, and ensure that you follow the manufacturer's instructions. Just uh, a few more words on these quaternary ammonium compounds that are used as disinfectants. And I mention these really um, almost as a hobby horse of mine uh, because they are products that are um, potentially problematic for patients. A large number of patients are allergic to methyl isothiazolinone in particular and also benzalkonium chloride. Um, these are very common preservatives increasingly found in a wide range of products. Benzalkonium chloride is used as a preservative in eye drops for example and it's widely known that patients over time can develop cumulative toxic reactions to it. But these products are also available um, and used ubiquitously in all sorts of everyday products, such as antibacterial soaps, um, shampoo, including the UK's leading brand, Head & Shoulders. They're used in dishwashing detergents, including, again, the brand leader, Furry Liquid, and in most supermarket-owned brand products. Um, at higher concentrations, products that are used as preservatives become disinfectants. So, for example, the common disinfectant Zoflora is a benzalkonium chloride uh, product, um, as are uh, almost all of the antibac sprays, such as Dettol Antibac. Methyl isothiazolinone causes so much allergy in the general population, it now has to be declared on the bottles. So when you look at the ingredients on cleaning and disinfection products, usually it will just say something like 5% um, anionic surfactants and words to that effect, which really tells you nothing about the individual ingredients. Um, methyl isothiazolinone and its various uh, incarnations, such as methyl chloro isothiazolinone, uh, have to be identified um, since 2012. Um, these products have also been banned in leave-on products such as sun creams and moisturizers and Nivea were a brand that was notably affected by this ban. Um, so if you're using these products to clean frames are you coating the frame with a potentially allergic um, compound that could cause a different kind of problem? I have no evidence for this, uh, but it is something that you should be aware of. There has been a great deal of talk about some of the operational issues that may affect optical practice as uh, practices get back to work and work in this um, enhanced uh, infection control environment. 
Um, in particular, practices want to minimise the risk of forced isolation or practice closure due to contract tracing. Some practices have, have operated bubbles of staff or uh, having different teams in on different days of the week so that they don't work together. And if one team was to become infected and had to stop work, for example, the other team could uh, step in uh, to fill the gap. In terms of practice closure due to contact tracing, uh, it's important to realise that if you are wearing personal protective equipment routinely um, and observing uh, social distancing when you're not um, wearing PPE, uh, then uh, contact tracers would not um, require you to stop work. Um, it may be that key staff would benefit from wearing enhanced personal protective equipment. So, for example, instead of standard paper surgical masks, they could wear uh, fully fitted um, filtration respirators, um, which can be reused time and time again and offer a much greater level of protection. Finally, as essential workers, uh, optical staff do have the ability uh, to uh, book uh, testing for testing for COVID-19 and the information uh, on this can be found on the .gov website. There's a link there for England and from that page you can easily find uh, the links for the other nations. So we've covered how you need to communicate with patients who require an eye examination or other optical care. It's important that we obtain from them information with regard to any recent COVID-19 symptoms. We also need to know whether they are in a vulnerable category. We may be able to tell this from their age, for example, if they're over 70, but we should also ask questions or consult their existing records with regards to any underlying health condition, such as diabetes, HIV AIDS or patients living with cancer. Patients with compromised immune systems are at a much greater risk from a disease like coronavirus and we need to make uh, sure that we are extra careful when dealing with them. We also need to understand whether the patient is having any optical symptoms as at the present time we are expected to prioritise patients with emergency care needs or who are symptomatic and require glasses, for example, or an eye examination because of some uh, loss of vision. And they should be prioritised over and above patients who are simply responding to routine eye examinations. We've looked at the latest evidence uh, to, uh, in relation to COVID-19 and how this is going to affect optical practice going forward. The good news is that COVID-19 is not as serious a disease as was initially thought and that it can easily be uh, deactivated or killed by routine cleaning and disinfection procedures and infection from the coronavirus uh, is um, easily um, prevented or reduced by the judicious use of personal protective equipment, social distancing, and above all, rigorous hand hygiene. If we adopt um, all of the procedures outlined in this um, presentation, then we will ensure a safe environment is provided uh, to deliver care to our patients in relation to coronavirus and every day and uh, we need to take appropriate action to ensure that this is the case. Your time in practice will be rather different going forward and infection control procedures should now be embedded uh, within the optical sector 
in a way that perhaps they weren't previously. Going forward, as we move through this particular pandemic, uh, we should think and be mindful about our infection control procedures in general. Often in times when costs are being cut, cleaning is one of the first things uh, to be reduced. And yet it is a vital service uh, in infection control. We need to think about how we behave when we ourselves as practitioners have a cold, for example. Most of us will drag ourselves into work. If we do, perhaps we should adopt what is common in the Far East and wear a face mask on, on those occasions. Thank you for your attention during this presentation. On this slide, you can see the references uh, that have been used. As was said at the beginning, this is a fluid situation and the advice and guidance is constantly changing. The advice, therefore, is not to rely on any of it, but to check your facts um, before taking any action whether that is the disinfection of frame materials or uh, the infection control advice from government. I hope you've enjoyed it and look forward to delivering another presentation soon. And finally, uh, please don't forget to complete your reflective learning statement prior to accepting your points uh, from the GOC. Thank you.